Okay. So welcome everyone to uh, the latest Midwest Newsroom training. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about audio features. Uh, I'm Chris Husted. I'm the senior content editor for the Midwest Newsroom. But before that, I was, I've been a reporter for 10 years, uh, primarily in Missouri. I uh, worked for Harvest Public Media for a good chunk of that. So uh, I have Sorry, a lot of reporting experience back from, uh, from those days. Uh, my co-host is uh, Maria Altman. She is the current editor of Harvest Public Media. Maria, you want to say hi? Yes, hello everyone. Um, so I've been with Harvest Public Media for like two months, um, but before that I was with St. Louis Public Radio for about 17 years. Um, four of those as an editor. Um, several years as a business reporter and before that um, as a general assignment reporter and also newscaster and newscasting and general assignment at several other public radio stations before that. And then we also have two wonderful guests joining us today. Um, we have Grant Gerlach yeah. and Shayla Farzan. Go ahead, Maria. I can, I can go ahead and introduce uh, the two of them. Grant Gerlach is with Iowa Public Radio. He covers central Iowa and Des Moines. Um, I am not certain how long, Grant, you have been with Iowa. I know you were with Nebraska Public Media before that and that you were also a hardest reporter. Um, so I can- Yeah, like IPR for just over three years. All right, great. And then Shayla Farzan, who is uh, with St. Louis Public Radio, um, who is serving as a bit of a part-time editor right now, but also covers um, just a ton of different issues, um, is officially general assignment, but has a real specialty in science and environmental reporting. And uh, Chris, I think I'll let you take it away with kind of talking generally about, you know, quickly what it what is a feature and then we can move on from there yep well, let's get started so can everyone see the screen okay awesome so today we're going to talk about uh kind of the prepping the the uh, what a feature is um what is in a feature and how to pitch your editor and find stories Basic audio feature generally, and a lot of you already know this, but let's just cover the basics. It's a scripted audio report that is on a topic relevant to your audience. It is something that is news value that you are going to deliver to your audience. Generally, in most newsrooms, that's going to be three and a half to four minutes. There are little slots that uh, are uh, in the NPR clock, which looks like this. Uh, you see A, B, C, D, and E. Generally, that's where the features are going. Um, and in the longer ones, sometimes it's two ways, which is an interview between the host and a guest or, or a panel. Um, and then the uh, um, within the smaller ones, so if you see like D right there, 359, that's a popular place to put um, a local feature. So the NPR clock is uh, the national clock, and then there are slots within that that local stations can choose to slip in a local feature. Um, it airs either generally on morning edition or all things considered. And this is the morning edition clock. And it airs in the, in the manner of a host introducing the feature, then playing the feature, uh, and then possibly have a back announce from the host. The expectations of the reporter are to deliver that final audio, to deliver the script with the host intro, and have that audio feature mostly mixed down. If you're, if you're uh, filing for national, then they'll mix it for you. Uh, if you're filing locally, you're probably gonna have to do it yourself. In an audio feature, again, super basics. There's four main components. There are, there is the reporter track. So that would be your voicing that the reporter uh, does once the script has been finalized. There is your interview sound bites. Sometimes those are called cuts or clips or actualities. They go by a lot of names, but these are your sound bites that you've chosen from your sources to be in the piece. There's also gonna be natural sound. Natural sound is going to be the wheelbarrow going by the fence with the shovels, the getting sand, putting the wheelbarrow to, to, to uh, make sandbags for the uh, oncoming flood that's anticipated. Those are the sounds that are gonna kind of pop out, those natural sounds. And then the ambient sound is the sound that's just happening naturally in the room or the field that you're in that uh, the interview is taking place. So you always want to make sure you get about a minute of ambient sound where you're where you're doing your interviews. 
Okay, finding your story. This is what a lot of people want to know. And it, I should say, if anyone has questions, I will try to keep an eye on the, um, the chat box. So feel free to chime in there. All right, how to find a story. Maria, do you want to kind of take these? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, at, when, when you first step into a reporting position, finding stories can seem a little daunting at times. I think the longer you're in uh, reporting, it almost becomes like too many stories, like stop, stop the ideas. Um, so I, I think it's partly, you know, your beat. Uh, if your general assignment and what what the sort of the expectations are for your role, um, in general, I have always found that going out and being doing spot stories is a fabulous way of finding bigger picture stories. And that when you're just out and about with people, you're generally going to find out new things that um, pique your curiosity and um, make you want to find out more. But I'd, I'd like to hear from um, Shayla and Grant about how they go about finding stories. What are the ones that they decide, yeah, that's that's a story I really need to tell. So I'll throw it to Shayla first. Yeah, I mean, I think that Maria, you covered it really well. I think a lot of it has to do with kind of being curious and observant in your own community at first. Um, so just trying to figure out, okay, like what's happening in my community? What are the things that pique my interest? Because if they pique your interest, they, they probably are going to be interesting to audiences. And we'll talk about shaping the ideas a little later. Um, and then what's the impact? And so I think that a lot of times when you're looking for story ideas, you might think, oh, that's too small. Like that's not enough to be a story. Idea. And almost always when you start peeling back the layers of something, it becomes more and more and more complicated, um, especially when we're talking about like local political issues. Um, so for instance, here in St. Louis, um, I often keep an eye on like neighborhood social media pages, which can be just a toxic slurry sometimes, but occasionally you can find really interesting story ideas there. So um, for instance, um, this was an issue that I covered and also Corinne Ruff covered, um, but folks in St. Louis were posting on social media saying, why are the garbage trucks collecting all of the recycling in St. Louis? Um, why are they no longer sorting recycling? Um, and I think we both kind of saw that and thought, what's going on? Um, and so that became a larger story about how, you know, the city of St. Louis had stopped sorting recycling and all of the recycling was going into the landfills here because they had staff shortages. Um, so that looked like a simple story idea on the surface and it's much deeper um, and has a lot more components to it. Um, and I think that another place that I'm often keeping an eye out for story ideas talking with the sources I've already interviewed. Um, so often when I am, you know, I'm wrapping up an interview, I'll ask a source, hey, you know, just one last question for you, like what else should we be covering? What would you be, what would you like to see journalists cover that they just haven't been covering? And often that's where you get some really, really interesting story ideas, um, especially if you were interested in kind of longer term um, reporting on that particular issue, that spot that you did can become sort of a springboard into much deeper stories. Um, so those are just kind of a couple basic ideas, but I'll toss it over to Grant too. A good way to get into doing feature stories if you haven't done many before is um, to look for stories to localize national trends. If there are bigger trends going on um, that you hear um, sort of basic news coverage about to localize, you know, housing prices or inflation or uh, or things like that. And to, to find an interesting twist on that, you might look for unexpected winners. Like it seems like rising house prices might be just about bad for everybody, but maybe there's some unexpected twist um, where someone is actually benefiting from it or unique solutions to a problem, you know, identifying a problem and then asking who's the person who's solving this problem and, um, who are the people helping people with this problem helps you find characters that might lead to interesting stories and and puts you down the path of finding those characters who are in the story uh, who are active in that topic that you're interested in um, another area if there's if there's a particular specialty area or um, just sort of a general topic that you're interested in 
Uh, I find it helpful to follow just like trade publications that may be a little bit too in the weeds for coverage on our air, but can help just kind of keep track of trends as they're building and changing. Um, or create a Twitter list around a particular topic that you're interested in, just kind of tracking what people are talking about. Yeah, that's that's great. Those are all great ideas. So I kind of I think like taking it now from like all those ideas and the things that that hit you and you think, yeah, I want to do a story. But that critical moment of taking something that's an idea and saying, yeah, I want to do something on that and then vetting it and narrowing it and and um, coming up with a, a really strong angle. Um, and Grant, maybe I'll throw it to you first. Um, how do you, when you see something and you think, yeah, I definitely wanna do a story on this. What are the steps that you take to figure out, okay, is this really a story? And what's the best way for me to tell it? Um, I think the first thing is that I, I try to identify um, what, what has really got me interested in this? Like, there might be things that seem like they're important stories. This thing is happening. It seems really important. Um, but to, to run that around in my head and figure out, well, what's, what's actually interesting? What is it that's unexpected or um, appeals to other people's curiosity or, or what really kind of appealed to my curiosity in the first place? Um, and that's sort of the for building a story around it. Also, I, I think uh, some important things I look for when I'm developing a story are scenes and characters. And is it likely that I'm going to find the scenes and characters that I'm looking for around something? Um, because if I can't, maybe this is more of uh, like a, a host two way than it is an audio feature. You know, there are other ways this story could take shape. Maybe it's not feature material. So those are some things I look for. Great. Um, Shayla, how about you? What do you, what do you do when you're like, I've got this a great idea, but now I need to figure out, um, is this the moment to tell it? How do I tell it? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, one thing that I'm constantly asking myself like early in the reporting process, but even throughout the reporting process is why am I trying to tell this story here in this particular place? And why now in this moment? Like, is there a specific peg for this story? Or is it kind of a more general story that could be told anytime? Um, and so I think that that's something that kind of you constantly need to be asking yourself as you're reporting a story. I think Grant covered a lot of the things that I would think of too. Um, honestly, I think that as I've progressed as a reporter, um, I have started putting a lot more emphasis and sorry, I've got a lot of sirens here in the background, so hopefully it doesn't get too loud. Um, I started putting a lot more emphasis on fact checking throughout the process. Um, I think that that's a really important component, especially when you're vetting a story idea. Um, when you're asking yourself, is this, is this actually a story? Sometimes you think you have an idea and then you do some basic fact checking and realize like, oh, this actually doesn't have a solid foundation or it doesn't have legs to stand on. Um, and so I think that that's also a really important component here. Chris, I'll let you jump in and take it to the next slide. All right, so you've found your story that you really think you you want to report. You, you, you like the audio uh, components that could be part of this and you've kind of thought through some sources. So it's time to put together a pitch for your editor. These are general definitions here, but ultimately a pitch is a focused, it could be a sentence or two, different editors prefer different uh, um, lengths of this, but generally uh, think of it as a quick way to uh, pique the interest of your editor. So a sentence or two that succinctly shows a story has news value. So that's what we're talking about the timeliness, the geography, the location of it, um, is there is it informational, whatever the news value is in it, there has to be something. <laughs> um, and then also that it demonstrates reporting that you're going out and talking to people and getting a story that has uh, value to your audience. It generally is going to answer the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Uh, maybe it doesn't actually fully answer all of those, but it will uh, have those components in it. So when your editor hears the pitch, they'll want to know more information about it. They're, they're interested in what you are uh, uh, pitching to them. 
uh, oftentimes we as reporters and we as editors have this struggle between a pitch and an idea. Ideas are going to be the general, I wanna do a story on climate change. I wanna do a story on um, safety on campus. Those are great ideas, but they are not focused pitches. So hopefully uh, when you were vetting your story, you found that focused angle. The pitch is gonna have the answers that your editor is already going to want to ask. Uh, so uh, who's the, who are the sources in the story? Uh, what's the story about? Why is it relevant to this audience? When did this happen? When is it happening? Uh, and for public radio, a big part of what we do is we contextualize and try to explain the why is this happening? Uh, not just the, hey, by the way, uh, the day the day turn story, which is, is the, hey, this is happening. The feature tries to do more of the contextualization of this is happening and here's why we think this is happening. Um, I think I wanna go to, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the next slide. So let's go with, let's go back to this. I wanna go ask Grant uh, and Shayla again, when you're putting your pitch together, what, what's going through your mind to make sure that you have a focused and driven pitch for your editor that they will be interested in trying to take this story? Uh, Shayla, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is, um, I'm thinking a lot about the editor that I'm pitching to at first. Um, because I think that in the early days of working with an editor, you're you're probably going to get a lot of no's or a lot of questions. And that's fine. I think because you're figuring out what they want and sort of where your interests overlap. Um, and I think that also, especially when you're working with an, with an editor sort of early on in the process, they want to know that you've done your research um, and that you know the story. Um, and then I think as you kind of develop a relationship with them more, you're able to give them ideas that are maybe a little bit more half-baked where you can sort of bounce, bounce those ideas off of them. Maria is smiling because she, I bounced a lot of half ideas off of her um, in the past. Um, and so I think that that's kind of a, a part of what is in my mind as I'm putting together a pitch is who am I pitching to? Um, this is going to kind of vary a little bit also depending on um, where you're hoping to air the story. So for instance, if you're putting together a pitch for your editor that you're working with at your NPR affiliate station, it's probably gonna look different than if you're pitching to a national outlet or you're sending a pitch to NPR. So I think that, that th these are all kind of important things to have in your mind. Um, but I think that you really covered a lot of the basics here um, in terms of what I'm putting into a pitch. Um, I think for me, one thing that I've always struggled with is I often will put too many details in a pitch. And I think, especially when I was early on, I would send these things that looked like academic papers that no one wanted to read. And I think, so I think that a big part of it is keeping it very, very focused and pithy um, and kind of focusing a lot more on um, the why now. I think that's a really, really critical part of the pitch to your editor. Yeah, I, I build a pitch initially around sort of three main things, what's happening, who's doing it, and why is it important? And uh, if I'm going to include a fact, I'm choosing like the one key thing that uh, would be the thing I want someone to take away from the story. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna build a pitch around. I'm gonna start with that and write it out. And I'm, I'm really thinking more of like a, a network pitch here and then, um, then see if I feel like it's a complete idea that I'm trying to, to pitch the network on. I think local stations probably have a lot of different ways that they handle the green process. It may be more formal or less formal, but I think that the things that, the ideas that you wanna have in mind should include that, uh, like Shayla said, why it's important. And then I think what's happening and who's doing it gets toward the, the timeliness of the story and um, sort of the main people, the main character that you want to include. I wanted to jump in and, and ask uh, both Grant and Shayla, I'll start with Grant. How do you go about finding out, especially with the national pitch, um, whether this story has been done before? What, what, do you, what are your kind of the steps you take to, to, to go, yeah, this, this is, there's, there's enough that's new here? So definitely search the NPR page and make sure they haven't aired something on it. Um, uh, and I don't, I don't know, I guess I, um, it's, it's sort of the, the main keywords I would search on it looking for 
news stories like under the news tab like what's what's actually coming up for for this kind of story um i don't know if i have anything more specific than that do you shayla no i mean i think that that's pretty much the process that i'm following too and often in a pitch i mean npr has been around forever right so like chances are they probably done something on this at some point and the editor that you were pitching is going to remember that exact story from 1994 and say we've already done that and and i think that it's really helpful if you can in your pitch to show that you've done your research and say i know that you did a story on you know whatever dwindling native bee population in 2010 and here's how this story idea advances that or how this is how this is different from that because then you kind of already show that you've done your research there too so i think that that has been really helpful for me especially when when doing more national stories one thing i would also throw in about npr pitches and i don't it just worked for me as a reporter is i generally wrote them as story intros so I basically gave the story intro for how I could hear it on air nationally. And that did seem, and then you know below that would give more details about who I would interview and, and where it sort of fit in um, nationally. But that seemed to work well. I agree. The, um, every editor is gonna want a different style of pitch. Not every editor will want a different style of pitch. Some editors want different styles. Some want a paragraph, some have a, 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 a official form that you fill out. Uh, some want it just pitched orally, some want it uh, in an email. So just check with which editor you're pitching to. Uh, along those lines, if you're pitching to um, Marketplace, make sure that there's some numbers and uh, money in uh, angle in that. If it's NPR, um, and you're pitching to uh, Ken Barkas for most of us, make sure you, well, for a little bit longer, know how, what he wants uh, in his pitches. You, you will tailor it to each editor and you, you know what information they want. When it's a brand new editor, which I encourage everyone to do, work with as many different editors as you can and makes you a better reporter, you learn different pitching styles uh, and it, it rounds you out as a reporter, uh, but also helps you make sure that whenever you pitch a new person, you you have a robust amount of knowledge before going in to the pitch, even though you're not gonna include all of that information. Along those lines, uh, here are some ideas or, or questions that your editor will likely ask you once they get the pitch. Number one, we've already covered this a bit, but what is the news value in the story? Does it have news value for the audience? Is there a driving story in your question? What's the heart of your, uh, th this is kind of the, um, the thesis of your story of, or, or the real reason why you're telling it. Uh, what is the story's driving question? At the end of this um, slide show, I will show you, uh, if you haven't seen it already, NPR's got a great little poster that helps you keep you focused on track of the story that, you're, that you wanna tell and not get sidetracked into all those uh, rabbit holes that we all fall into sometimes. Who are your sources? This is a big one because for a audio feature, you only have space to talk to three. If you can squeeze four in, that's a miracle. Uh, people in your story. Uh, Grant and Shayla, we'll go back to you about this. Um, how do you decide who your sources are for your uh, story? I'll start with who, who went first last time? Grant? Well, great. I think Shayla started first. Okay, go ahead. Um, although I wouldn't mind Shayla going first here. No, just kidding. Um, so I, I want there was a way that they talked about this during a Planet Money talk once, and they talked about finding characters and um, sort of how to frame your search for the character for a story. They talked about looking for who loves it, who does it, and who is it. And it was just a different way of almost visualizing the kind of person that you're looking for. So that's something I do in the story process. It may not be a specific name at first, it may not be even a specific organization, but I'm, I'm trying to think about in terms of the, the kind of person that I want to talk to, someone who really cares about it might be someone who loves it, who does it, or who is it, someone who's intimately involved in the story that I'm working on. Um, so that's, that's part of um, how I think about people that I'm looking for, sources that I'm looking for for a story. Um, 
And then, the, but that's like outside of experts, you know, and there are a lot of different ways to find organizations and universities and look for studies or other different ways you can find experts for a story. It's often more challenging to find the quote unquote real people that you want to, to include. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that a little bit, um, I think that it, it can be really challenging to source your stories, especially when you're starting with sort of more of a concept story um, rather than this thing is happening in my neighborhood or my city and I'm going to report on it. Like if you're starting with an idea, like um, like for instance, I did a story about uh, people who are working past the age of 65 in St. Louis. Um, and this was kind of one of the early features that I had did um, in St. Louis. And that was actually a pretty challenging feature to source because you were kind of going out and looking for like your unicorn interviewees who were working past the age of 65, but also had interesting stories and can could kind of contribute to and advance the story that I wanted to tell. Um, so that can be challenging, I think, depending on the type of feature that you're, you're, you have an eye on. Um, so sort of general rules that I'm keeping in mind for sourcing stories. Um, and this, it varies a lot so much depending on the topic, but um, if you're covering a, a topic or an issue that um, is more controversial or is you know more politicized, I think it's always helpful to include an outside expert or someone who's a little bit further away from that particular topic or issue and can kind of zoom back and give you a little bit more context and perspective rather than sort of falling into the bo both sidesisms of um, reporting, which we often can can do. Um, another thing I think that I'm always trying to keep in mind is um, talking to the people who are actually affected or have something at stake. And I think that this is something that I constantly have to remind myself to do, especially um, with, with kind of shorter term reporting, but also with feature reporting, because I think that you can kind of fall into this trap where you know, oh, I've, there's a new study out or a new report, and I'm going to talk to that researcher about this report, um, and not necessarily talk to the people who have something at stake. So, you know, for instance, don't just talk to the researcher who just did a report on, you know, ballooning housing prices. Um, talk to somebody who's been priced out of the market who can't afford any uh, house anymore. Um, so, I think that that's what, what I'm always thinking about too, especially when I'm trying to make sure that the sources in my story are actually kind of advancing the story and each have a role to play, if that makes sense. It does. Maria, when you're listening to pitches, what when you're when you're looking for what sources the reporter is possibly going to use, what 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 do you like to hear and what advice do you typically give? Yeah, I mean it it really it partly depends on timing. Um, like how much time do we have to do the story? Uh, I'm thinking about a feature earlier this year when I was St. Louis Public Radio um, kicking off a, a deeper look into wealth inequality. And the piece was going to be an explainer. If we had had months and months to do it, it would have been really, really great to go out and find people who were sort of affected by wealth inequality, but, but we didn't have the time. So it had to be expert driven. Um, and in that story, the structure, uh, the timing sort of pushed what sources we could get and the structure that we had to use, which we turned it into more of an explainer piece and it turned out really well. Um, uh, we're also at Harvest doing a story right now about um, the USDA promised underserved farmers four billion dollars in debt relief last year that's been tied up in court for a year. This is a story that's been covered by a lot of different outlets, but um, I just really feel like it's important that we step into the river of this story. And so we're going to do it is a profile of a black farmer who's been affected. Um, so rather than sort of a typical four source, four and a half minute piece that looks at this issue broadly, it's um, more taking uh, the farmer as the expert. And then of course, Dana Cronin, who's working on it, is gonna do interviews with other people to make sure her, her the underlying reporting is, is really solid. And um, so that's kind of a long answer, but it, it does really depend on timing where you're kind of, is this, um, is this a really huge topic that we're gonna to have to break out into a few different stories? Um, so, but, 
but very much what Grant and Shayla were saying too. You definitely want to find people who are affected by the thing. Just talking to the researcher um, is is just not quite enough. And I honestly learned from Shayla, one of the tricks of, of research reporting is going out and finding another researcher who's done similar kinds of work and kind of getting their take on this on the on the study. Like, was this done well? <laughs> um, and, it, and that's something that um, we're doing now at Harvest. Um, so anyway, that's a, one thing that I want to ask about, though, with the reporters is how do you decide whether something is a spot or is it a feature? Um, because sometimes there's not as much difference between the kind of work that you're having to do with online reporting now. So the, the, the difference between a feature and a spot is, is they are not as far apart as they used to be. So Grant, what do you, how do you make that choice? Um, I think part, part of it is I like to be able to take listeners to the story. So that's one determining factor. Can I, can I take people there? Can I have a great scene to go with this that'll help carry the story narratively? Um, is there a reason that this might benefit? Like you were talking about some different structures, like more of a profile or something like that. That might be a reason to make it a feature instead of a spot. And um, I don't know, it, it's you no, know, when you're doing a spot, it's gonna be what, 45 seconds long. Some stories are just too complex to really give people the full context in that time. And um, that's what's great about a feature. So um, if it's a story that needs to have that complexity that you can add some narrative interest and um, an audio interest with some sound from a scene or sound from a place that illustrates what you're talking about. Those are reasons that I want it to be a feature instead of a spot. And something we do fairly often also is just like a host two-way. And I think sometimes I'll have, um, you know, real people in a, in a two-way, but the difference is uh, it might be timing. Do I have time to meet them in person and do more of an intimate interview? that would be suitable for a feature and, uh, and then the, the time to write and produce it as well. Yeah, Shayla, how, how do you make that decision? Oh, this is such a hard question, honestly. And I think that this is still something that I um, am weighing with every single story. Um, I think that kind of going back to something that Chris said earlier on, um, I think that spot news is really good for, for quick reactions. Like this thing is happening now or they just announced X program. Um, and I think feature reporting, you know, the strength of feature reporting is that you can circle back in, you know, six months to a year and say, okay, how did that, how did that work out? <laughs> you know, um, what was the outcome of that program that said that it was gonna do X, Y, and Z? Um, where did it fall apart? Where did it succeed? Um, I think is kind of a simple way of looking at it. Um, for me, one thing that I'm, I often do, especially when I have sort of a more complicated feature in mind or, or investigative work, um, is I often do multiple spots on my way to doing a feature. And I'm sure this is something that a lot of you guys do too. Um, it helps a lot because uh, it helps you build your sources, um, especially if you're working with sources who maybe haven't really talked to journalists before or are hesitant to talk to journalists or have had bad experiences in the past showing that you are committed to covering that topic over the long haul can help a lot when you're trying to, you know, build up that trust and, and do a, a deeper feature, a deeper investigation. Um, so that's something that's been really, really helpful to me along the way. Um, but no, I mean, I, I totally agree with Grant. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact, like, does this merit four or five minutes? And as the reporter, I think your knee-jerk reaction is always to say, like, yeah, of course it does. Um, but I think you kind of need to take a step back and say like, if I were a listener and I was making dinner, but I want to listen to five minutes about this. Um, and the answer is, is often, it's more often no than I would like. Um, but no, I think it's, you're kind of constantly assessing that with every single story. Along those lines, um, you both touched on it a little bit there, but uh, one of the questions an editor is going to want to ask if, if this is a genuine feature is a little different 
during COVID, but what are your scenes going to be? Where's the scene? Where am I going to see the rubber meet the road on this story? Um, and there, oftentimes we've talked about this also, um, scenes and sources go hand in hand. So if you're starting from something happening in your neighborhood, like Shayla mentioned, you know where that rubber meets the road already. You know where you can get a scene most likely, and then you're building back that way. Oftentimes, like Maria was just talking about too, you have the USDA story that you got to do something on and you have the idea, the concept of something that's happening, but you got to work your way backwards from that to find where you can tell that story, where that scene is. Um, uh, Shayla and Grant, we'll start with Shayla this time. How do you find those scenes from either of those directions? Or I guess from the, from the reverse direction, starting with the concept and then trying to find the scene in the source where you can have those, that, uh, that compelling interaction or uh, scene with natural sounds that the audience will um, be drawn into. Oh, it's just so much harder, I think, to find scenes that way. Um, but it is very satisfying when you do. So I think that often it just takes a little bit more research um, and maybe a little bit more pre-interviewing. So sometimes, like when I'm starting with a concept story where I don't necessarily know what the scene will be, you kind of have to do a couple interviews first or pre-interviews to figure out, okay, what is happening here? Um, when When is there going to be some sort of action that takes place that I could join along with. Um, so I'm thinking of an example that I did um, of a story that Maria and I edited together. It was about uh, tick viruses. Um, and so, you know, there's this kind of idea that there are all these emerging tick-borne viruses in the Midwest, especially in Missouri, because we have an insane number of ticks here. Um, so there's just a lot more opportunities for more novel viruses and diseases to emerge here. Um, and so I knew that this research was taking place, but I didn't necessarily know what the scene would be. Um, so it involved doing some interviews and pre-interviews with the researchers first to figure out like, okay, walk me through exactly what you're doing here from start to finish. I wanna know every single step that you're doing to test these ticks and collect these ticks because then it could give me an idea of like, oh, that actually sounds really interesting or that could be a good place for me to go. Um, and so that story eventually kind of became me following along with the researchers in the field as we were collecting hundreds and hundreds of ticks, um, which was horrifying. Then later going back and meeting a different group of people who were like whirring these ticks down into little tick milkshakes to test them. Um, and so I didn't know that those were going to be scenes in the story until I had done some of those interviews and done some kind of background reporting first. Um, sometimes, those are good examples. Sometimes like taking the expert with you somewhere um, for like almost like a stand-up interview type situation can be a way to, to build a scene out of uh, thin air, so to speak. Um, um, I'm trying to think of, I don't have any more immediate suggestions than what Shayla added right there. I, I think it's um, sometimes knowing what you're going to need um, as you as you think about a story so that you can have conversations with uh, maybe your researcher or your expert who's going to help you find that that person to talk to. Um, Shayla, I'm thinking about the story you did on smell studies where people who had lost their sense of smell and kind of doing the upfront work of making sure that that you could sit down with somebody who actually was in the program, you know, like working to get their smell back. Yeah, and I think Grant brings up a really good point too, is that sometimes there is not an action, right? Like it, it maybe the action already passed and you missed that opportunity to record that amazing scene for your feature. Um, and so I think then you kind of have to do some detective work and figure out like, okay, did anyone record this on their cell phone? Like, is there any kind of audio of this that we could use as a scene? Are there, um, I'm thinking of a story I did where I, I relied heavily on archival tape um, and Facebook live videos that people recorded. And so I built scenes around that because the action had long since passed for those features. It was years in the past. Um, and so I think that that can be a really good way if you kind of find yourself stuck in that situation that we all hate to be in where there is no live scene to record. Um, and I also think like Grant has a really good suggestion of sort of going back to your interviewees and using some sort of creative interviewing techniques to say like, okay, take me back to when this happened. 
what were you feeling? What, what did it smell like? What did, what did it feel like to be there? Um, and then in some ways you can almost kind of create that like um, that old scene with them. I, I don't think it's as, quite as strong as being able to be there and record the action, but sometimes, especially in narrative work, you have to do that. I, I have an ex example actually of, of what you're talking about, especially with the, um, with finding other tape to kind of create the scene. Um, you know, a couple of examples, uh, St. Louis Public Public Radio's education reporter, Kate Grumke, doing a story about uh, book bans. She was able to, I mean, the pandemic was good in the sense of there was a lot of recorded meetings, right? A lot of Facebook Live um, meetings. And she was able to take uh, audio of people complaining about books in front of school boards and use that as sort of a waterfall and make a scene out of that. Um, I just edited a piece with Elizabeth Rembert in Nebraska where she really had a hard, she wanted to do a, a piece about the F-150 Lightning and electric vehicle. She was really wanting to sit down with a bunch of farmers at sort of a, a cafe or morning, you know, a coffee and talk to them about like, would you drive, would you buy a Lightning? And that just didn't come together. She wasn't able to get that tape, but the scene she ended up using was the sound of uh, a, you know, a gas you know, combustion engine F-150 starting and then uh, an advertisement from Ford about their new lightning. So a scene isn't always what you think it's going to be. Sometimes you have to have a plan B. I'll, I'll add in um, Niara Savage just did a, uh, one of our Midwest newsroom fellows did a story um, about lead poisoning in children and the source she had uh, had dealt with that with her son but 10 years ago so how do we get a scene to get us to relate to the family and when in doubt i th i always say um do a tour just give us a tour of your house they're not even in the same house but there are new things in the house they, their house has lead free crowns lead free toys lead free uh dishware and niara went there and interviewed the family and asked them to show me all your lead free things and so that was our entry point to the scene and then at the end, we get this wonderful moment where their two-year-old daughter is playing with lead-free toys. Um, and that's that's just such a more compelling, engaging way for the listener to get into a story. Um, it's a story that started 10 years ago, but right now it's it's where they're at right now. Uh, and a tour is a great place to do that. Uh, if the, the, the other thing I would say is um, if it's an event that happened in the past, older people will have um, photo albums and you can ask them to go through their photo album and point things out and then you get them recalling the story and that's great. Uh, people who don't have photo albums anymore can scroll through their phone and show you the photos of when the event happened and ask them questions about it so you kind of get that you get the narrative of what was happening then and what they were feeling then and then it's all the tricks of your questions and your interview process to make sure that you're really drawing a good story out so it's recreated as a memory for your scene and that works. Um, one other thing I would say is a good uh, tactic for a scene is it doesn't always have to be uh, interactions are action. So if it's just two people talking um, in the middle, say you're interviewing a, a, a couple and their kid comes in and says, mom, dad, blah, 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 blah. That could be a great scene to get us uh, into that family. It doesn't have to be them doing the dishes together or cooking a pizza, that which is great. It could be an interaction as well. And that, as simple as that. So just having a plan before you go into it, which we'll talk a, lo a little bit more about tomorrow, about what your scenes could be. This all saying, this is a question that your editor will have. <laughs> what kind of scenes are you thinking the story could tell? You can always change, but uh, at least have a plan. Um, Cassidy just uh, chatted that sometimes she uses dialogue in different language as your scene. Cassidy, do you wanna tell us a little more about what, what, what that means? No, you just wanna say that? <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, it was just that um, I speak to a lot of Spanish speakers and sometimes if the story kind of lacks a lot of like not sound or like scenes, I'll just use them talking to their families in Spanish as like the not sound and like not really worry about um, translating it and just kind of let that be. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we talked about this a little bit, but also, has anyone else done this story? Uh, has anyone used these sources before? Are these sources overused? Um, that is someone on public radio. You'll hear a lot of people, especially as experts, that are constantly the same people. Have you looked for 
uh, other people? Have you looked for uh, people of color? Have you looked for uh, color uh, sources that are not the standard academic old white man? I think it's ethically important that we try to find sources that are underrepresented, especially on public radio. So that's something question that I would ask. Uh, Harvest, we always were trying to find uh, anyone besides the old white man farmer, <laughs> which is a challenge, but um, they do exist. So putting a little footwork on the front end of your pre-reporting during the pitch will help sell an editor a lot more of, of, of having a voice represented in the piece that isn't typically in that type of a story. That's, that's a good plus. Um, also, what other outlets have covered this? Grant said, have you looked on NPR? Have we done this story before? Very important. And if there has been reporting on the story, are you advancing it? Is, is the story moving along uh, a little bit further? I did wanna ask Shayla and Grant about, so you're covering a story that's in the news constantly. How are you making sure that you're advancing that story for the listeners? What, what goes through your thought process on that? Uh, I'll start with Grant this time. Um, I really liked what Maria said about the story they're working on about the USDA program, like looking for a different structure to tell a story can be a great way to to provide our listeners with, I think, one of the things that they come to us for, which is oftentimes a little more depth into a story or um, a, a different perspective on a story. So uh, spending more time with the people who are directly affected in a story, I think, is is one way that you can advance it just by taking listeners closer to the issue at hand. Um, and my mind went blank. I'll pass on for the moment. Yeah, no, Grant, I think that you covered it really well. Um, often when I'm thinking about a story idea that other outlets have covered, um, I'm thinking about our our sort of unique superpower as radio reporters, which is we can use sound in creative ways um, that a newspaper or maybe a digital publication can't. Um, and so often I'm thinking about trying to, and I think Grant, you might've mentioned this, like take people where the story is happening. So, you know, let's say that there was a really bad tornado that leveled a whole bunch of buildings in, um, you know, mid-Missouri. And maybe there are a whole bunch of national outlets there um, but you have the ability to take people inside those homes that, you know, were partially destroyed and actually record what it sounds like to be there. Um, and so I think that, you know, obviously you kind of want to be looking for new angles and new voices and new ways to frame that story and get a little bit more in depth. But I also think that, you know, being able to use sound creatively is, is another really important thing that we have in our tool belt. Okay. That's great. This uh, page kind of not wraps up, but summarizes a lot of the things that we just covered, but I think it's important to, to see it all together. Your dream tape, that's your sources and your scenes. Uh, what structure do you think the story should take? Uh, Grant talked about that a little bit there. Uh, that's a fun way to mix it up. The general template for a NPR feature is often a scene. Uh, then we pull back bigger, talk to an academic and people uh, who have the bigger picture, and then we return back to the scene. You don't have to do it that way. That's just kind of an easy way to, uh, uh, to tell the story. Um, but maybe this is more of a two-way. Maybe this is, uh, this is uh, just a scene at the end. It, it, it totally depends on your story, but have that idea going in with your pitch of what you think the structure of the story could be. Um, Maria, do you want to talk about standalone series spot feature? We kind of touched it a little bit, but. Yeah, that, you know, as you're going through and thinking about your story, um, if it's a really complicated subject matter, it might be hard to fit it into four and a half minutes and, and just being realistic about what can we get, you know, get through. Right now we're talking about doing a piece at Harvest Public Media about carbon credits. Well, we're gonna to have to explain what carbon credits are before we can look at, are they effective? And so, you know, we're, we're not at the stage yet where we know exactly how we're gonna approach that story. Um, but my gut is it's probably gonna to have to be a two-part thing. Um, sometimes, you, you know, you don't have, sometimes you have flexibility and sometimes you don't. There were, times um, at St. Louis Public Radio where we get into a story and go, that's an e-segment. We need seven minutes for this piece. 
Um, it should be a really high bar to get to that. You've got to have really compelling tape. You probably need at least two scenes um, to stretch it out like that. But um, those are the kind of things as you're vetting the story, as you're figuring out who your sources are, as you're doing interviews, that you might st still be having conversations with your editor about, wait, I think that this isn't gonna fit into to four and a half minutes. Um, yeah, and the same with the spot or a feature. Like sometimes um, you've got a really interesting thing that you end up just not having the time. Um, it maybe it just doesn't fit into your um, your schedule to do a feature. And, and the piece that kind of I think about, Shayla did a story about um, prisoners who make quilts in the Missouri correctional facilities. And I mean, it sort of says, oh yeah, that should absolutely be a feature. Frankly, I can't remember why it wasn't a feature, but I have I have to think it had to do with the access and getting into those the, the prisons and actually doing the sewing, or it might have just been timing on Shayla just didn't have time. Um, do you remember what the thought process was for oh, us? I'm trying to think, and I can't quite remember. I think that I honestly think it was an issue of timing. Um, that it was also a time that um, they were not allowing outside visitors into the prisons but it could have been a feature just with phone tape we just decided now let's do it as a spot and we'll do a really nice web build out um so we we kind of pushed a lot of energy into making a really beautiful web story with photos which then got picked up by other news outlets um and so in the end i was like well maybe it was fine that we didn't do a feature it's okay right and so i, I you know what i'm saying is like this is some, there are no hard and fast rules and some, and you have to be really realistic about what your, um, you know, what your workload is. And sometimes a spot and a great web post is, is what you have time to do. Um, so anyway, I went off there a little bit, but um, uh, the, the last thing on timeliness, I think is always a really important, um, important bit. When is the story going to get the most attention? Sometimes how I think of it. Uh, if you're doing a story that is about, um, well, you know, we did a story about with Shayla uh, for Harvest on warming winters. We knew that that story had to, to run in the winter. Otherwise, people just aren't going to be quite as interested. So those kinds of things have to factor into when you're deciding to, is this a feature? Is this a spot? When do I run this? One thing I don't have on here that uh, many editors will ask, even though this is an audio focused uh, um, story that we're talking about is what are your visuals gonna be? Cause we all want that. Speaking of so much of the digital versions of these stories and where they live after they air on the radio. Um, I'm wondering before we get into the, Q, the questions uh, part of this, training um, Grant and Shayla, have you ever had a pitch that you got sent back to rework and then came back with it and got it approved? I'm trying to think of one. I, you know, I've definitely had pitches that have been sent back to me with questions um, or someone that's a little bit more skeptical. Um, and sometimes that means that I have pitched it somewhere else. Um, so for instance, I'm thinking about a story that I did about um, church, old church buildings in St. Louis that are being converted into new uses. So we have like an old church here that's a skate park and we have one that's a hotel and all these different things. So using all these empty buildings. And so I pitched that to National and it was rejected. And then I turned around and pitched it to the religion desk at NPR. And then I let those two editors sort of duke it out about whether or not it was worth doing. And then we eventually did the story. And so I don't think that's gonna work for, for many stories, but I think that sometimes a no isn't necessarily a no, no. It's just um, trying to figure out, okay, why are they rejecting it? Is there any way that we can try to retool it or can we take it to another show? Um, so I think that, especially early on when you when you get a rejection like that, it can take the wind out of your sails and you think like, oh gosh, I mean, that's not worth doing that story at all then. Um, and I think that as I've kind of progressed in my career, I've realized like, no, there's a place for almost every story, unless it's a bad pitch. Um, but often if you put a lot of time into it, it's probably a good pitch and probably someone is interested in doing that story. 
I think most often that's been a, a matter of timeliness, especially working within um, harvest or, or locally. Um, I'm thinking of topics that I covered over a long period of time, just sort of developing issues in the ethanol industry or that type of thing. I can see something is going on, but when is the right time to really pull the trigger and do a story about it? When is it um, going to be most meaningful for our audience and give the best opportunity to find a good scene and that kind of thing? So, um, so for the most part, I think for me, it's come down to, is this story ripe yet or do I need to leave it on the tree a little longer? <laughs> to use a metaphor. I, uh, yeah, I would like to, one thing I did mention is um, in the most crass way, the uh, editor is gonna ask you, so what, after your pitch? Like, so what? Like, why does this matter? You know, why are we doing this? All, you know, we said it in a much more polite way, but that's ultimately what we're trying to drive at. So if it does get turned down, I like what you said, Shayla, there is likely a home for it if you think the story is really uh, important and you wanna tell it. Um, if you pitch nationally, turn it down, pitch it to another show, uh, pitch it to, there's been a number of times my story has landed on Marketplace because it was better fit for them than it was for NPR. Uh, or Here and Now is a great place to, that likes to take some stories that may not land in Morning Edition or ATC, but uh, still gets a good audience and deserves that audience. And locally is a great place to air your stories too. Don't forget, like if you have high aspirations for your story and you think it's a national story but it just doesn't get picked up there you should still do the story if you can locally um or maybe just hold off on it and then pitch it again later when the timeliness is more relevant for for that um for that pitch um i'm gonna move on to the end here before we ask some questions we're right on schedule uh tomorrow's session is going to be about uh, organizing yourself for your reporting actually going out and doing the reporting and then get when you what you do when you get back to your desk uh, and then have to sit with all your tape and write it all out. Um, a great place to go look that has a lot of this information and beautiful little uh, um, digital articles is training.npr.org. Um, they've been really uh, developing that site that has a lot of this information with wonderfully, wonderfully talented people like Grant and Shayla chiming in to uh, give their tips and advice and their experiences. And then this also lives on there. Uh, it probably looks small if you have your laptop open, but I can share this out. Uh, but it's a nice little poster that NPR has put together that I had printed up above my desk when I was out reporting because I need to always remember to keep this in mind when I'm reporting that I that I uh, had this vision for the story and this is what it is. That's not to say you can't be nimble and have to pivot if you need to, but there's so many interesting things as reporters, we all know is that we find while we're reporting that you can't get too deterred from that. This kind of keeps your focus. Um, do we have any questions for um, either Maria or myself or our panelists on uh, pitching, finding stories, organizing yourself? Um, I guess before, I'll start with one and then if people have questions, feel free to chime in, or chime in, in the chat box. Grant and Shalo, your pitch has been officially given the green light. What do you do next? Grant, uh, you take that one first. <laughs> <laughs> um, then it's go time. Um, I think I start with the things that I think will be hardest, which are usually those central characters in those scenes. Like I had these ideas on my in my head, and maybe I've already done some legwork to develop these things, but um, now it's time to, to identify specific people and, and get going. Um, so yeah, so those are the things I really started with is putting out the calls and emails and whatever other messages I need to do to, to identify those central characters who I think are most critical to having a full story when it's all said and done. Yeah, I'll echo all of that. And I think too, one thing that I do often when I'm sort of pitching and pre-reporting, I don't sink a lot of time into that process. Like I don't do a lot of interviews, if any recorded interviews at all, 
um, beforehand. And so I agree with Grant that that's kind of why, where the rubber meets the road and you start to really do a lot more of your interviews. I'm also kind of a research nerd. So I love to sort of like dive in to other, you know, publications and try to um, think about what data could be used in that story and start to also think about um, things like data graphics and visuals too, because I, I think, I know we're talking a lot about feature reporting, but those things take a lot of time too, especially when we're so digital focused now. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth thinking about that ahead of time and planning if you can. Yeah, and so there is a question from Eleanor Nash that, um, that says the pre-reporting seems to be fairly involved before pitching. Um, how do you all decide which ideas to pursue? Shayla, for, for you, like, I mean, vetting probably gets faster and faster. The more experience you have with it is, is sort of what I'm thinking is the answer. Yeah, and not every story is going to require an enormous amount of kind of um, legwork beforehand, especially like some of the story ideas that we were talking about earlier, where we know this thing is happening. Um, so for instance, I did a story today about um, a coding program for incarcerated people in Missouri. That's basically kind of like a, an educational program for them. So I knew that this thing was happening. I knew I was going to the prison. Um, so I pitched the idea to my editor, but I wasn't doing it kind of an enormous amount of background research beforehand. I knew that like, prison education is important. It reduces recidivism. I told him that, gave him the information, and then I went and did the reporting at the prison. Um, so I think it's going to vary so much from feature to feature how much time they're putting in. But I do agree with you, Maria. I think it, it gets faster the more that you do it. I would say if, if you find yourself spending a lot of time just in your spare time or something, looking up something, that's a pretty good suggestion that you're interested in it and might want to pursue it as a story. So, you know, it it's good to kind of trust your curiosity if there's something that's really um, just kind of getting to you and encouraging you to look up more about it and what other people have done about it. That might be a sign that it's something you ought to pursue. More questions? Yeah. yeah. I would say also um, the more sometimes the more tabs you have open, that doesn't mean your your story is ready. That means you're just doing more and more research trying to find that story or that question that you want to ask. Um, it, your tabs will build open the more you go into your reporting. But uh, if you're constantly researching, just you got to make sure that you have that focus that your editor will want to hear. What's the story? Why are we telling this now? Who are your sources? And when you finally go out, what are your scenes? Um, because each story kind of reaches that moment, like love it or leave it, you know, am I really going to do this or not? And so one thing I'll do, and sometimes I'm more organized than others, but I have a document where a lot of just sort of general ideas go. And as, as I'm developing questions, I'll throw them in there, just, you know, something I'm going to search later or, or whatever. But one of those questions might become the driving question of the story. So as those questions pop into your head, it's worth writing them down. And if you reach that point where you have to, you know, reach an ultimatum with this story and you're not sure if it's there or not, go back to that list of questions and it might be sitting there waiting for you. So we have another question um, from Samantha Horton. Is there a story planning doc that you use and really like, something that makes you think through audio, visual, and engagement? Do you guys have a particular sort of like template or is this just something that's sort of ingrained that you kind of know sort of your own process? Yeah, I don't have a specific template um, that I use. And now that you've suggested that, Samantha, I feel like that's a really good idea and maybe I'll try doing that to be more organized. Um, but often with my, and I know we're gonna kind of cover this tomorrow, but I think often I'm kind of just dumping everything initially into one big Google doc, you know, like in terms of like, this is all of like the background research that I've done. And these are the people that I wanna interview and these are potential scene ideas. Because for me, it's so much easier to have it all living in one single document where I can kind of scroll up and down and organize it by section rather than having, you know, a whole bunch of different things to try to organize and keep track of. But I am definitely, as Chris said, a 10 million tabs kind of person. 
Um, and it is a real, uh, it's a real relief when you have to update your laptop and you have to close all those tabs. Terrifying. Um, yeah, I do. I wish mine was a little more organized in order to look at it, but it, it's a big Google doc. That's what I'm doing. So put your tips in the comments. Um, I have a question uh, as well. So um, when we're pitching to national level, um, you know, often we're like Grant was kind of saying, we're taking um, stories at a local level. Um, when the national editor kind of asked that, like, you know, dun 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 question of why do people care outside of wherever you are? What what are you thinking about when you're trying to best answer that big question? Well, one thing I have learned is don't promise that this is the first ever or the biggest, unless you know, like for, I mean, because Ken Barkas is especially suspicious of it's the first, it's the biggest. So, th so that's somewhat, you have to be a, a little careful of that. But I think it's, um, I think of stories in two ways for national. One, it's either something that's happening locally and it's a it's it's a trend. It's a you can do the the sort of microscope and then zoom out 10,000 feet and show how is this affecting other states? Um, maybe it's a particular legislative bill that's being introduced and also happens to be in 30 other legislatures. Um, so th so that's one way of thinking it or it's so incredibly unusual, which I think those stories are a little more rare, frankly, um, but it's so interesting and unusual that it's just gonna be of interest to people nationally. But I, I think most stories you do have to, to go, why is this important to people who are not in my state? Why is this important to people who aren't even in my region? Um, and the, it, once you have the answer to that question, then you sort of tease that up for the editor. Other questions? Um, while we're waiting, I do have one for Grant and Shayla. Um, what do you do when you can't get the source you really want in that feature that's really important to have? Say it's uh, maybe more of a public figure that you're just not going to be able to get for for the story. How do you still tell that story, or do you still tell that story? Does this mean that the person maybe has declined an interview, or they declined, just or, not available? or uh, let's say let's say declined? Um, for me, I think the internet is a deep, deep well of wonderful audio. Um, and so especially when we're talking about more influential people or political figures, if you dig enough, if you do enough digging, you can almost always find audio of that person speaking at a public meeting, giving a press conference, um, even potentially talking with other news outlets, if you can get um, permission from that news outlet to use the audio. Um, so there have definitely been instances where I have had political figures decline to do interviews with me and I've said, okay, um, I would love to not have to rely on archival tape, you know, of this person. I would really love to do an interview, but in the, in this case, I'm going to have to go back to that, you know, deep well of information. Um, so that's, I think one, one way to get around it. Um, and then on the other hand, like for instance, um, there was a, a man who, it, um, had been inside this Amazon warehouse when tornadoes came through the St. Louis area. He was really, really badly injured. He was in the hospital. He was not in a position to do an interview when he was released. Um, but we were able to go to the news outlet that he had done an interview with when he was in the hospital and get permission to use that tape from that interview. Um, so I think there are kind of a couple different ways that you can get around it, but Grant, if you have other ideas, I would really love to hear them. Um, gosh. Um, I don't know. Those are really great suggestions. If it's, I first thing, you, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Maria. I, I was thinking, I'm sure when you're doing re reporting, 
you've got your dream tape, like you've got your dream source, but you also have your plan B. I mean, that's how as a, as a reporter and as an editor, I often think, okay, here's the, here's the like, this is the, the goal. But sometimes you just can't get that perfect person or the person that you think would be the, you know, so you have to kind of have other people in mind. And I, I you know, and when you're scrambling on stories day to day, I'm sure you do that all the time. Like, well, I'll go with the person who's not quite who I who I wanted, but will serve in this role. Um, yeah, re-examine if that's really an essential person and maybe there's someone as a tangent that can serve the purpose. Since I see Cassidy on here and Steve helped with this, but Cassidy, when you did your quiet title story, um, obviously there was a person that you really wanted in the story, the, the, the antagonist, if you will, who declined uh, multiple times. How did you do address that in your story? Well, um, I did have the help of you, Chris, and Steve to help out with that. Um, but basically, I still wanted to give um, that person kind of as much credit, as much fair credit as I could. Um, so as her, like, like, like um, as her defense, I guess you could say very loosely, I just listed as many facts as I could um, without going too deeply into any further context that I couldn't really go into without her talking about it. Um, and then, you know, I just had to include that she nor her attorney uh, wanted to speak for the story. Um, so I, I just tried to still be as fair as possible with just using the documentation that I had. I, I'd add in too, you gave her multiple opportunities to even the day before saying, hey, last chance. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I was lucky with her actually like saying like, no, I don't want to talk. Like, so like I had that of like, you know, on paper, uh, you know, well, virtual paper. Um, so I don't, I think it's much harder if you just don't get a response at all. We have two minutes. Is there anything else anyone would like to ask real quick? Um, otherwise, uh, Maria, do you have anything else you'd want to add? Kind of what you were just talking about. I think sometimes if you've got somebody who's in the public eye and really a public official who really should go on tape, you can use um, you can use voicemail to, to good effect. And, and you know, you can kind of generate your uh, a scene even by just recording, getting voicemail again and, and then writing around, you know, we contacted so and so ten times over this many weeks and you know, so, so keep that in mind. But I think it is absolutely um, important, like um, as Cassie was talking about, with, with being really fair in, the, in what you do know, in the facts that you have, even if somebody does decline, being really, um, being sure to include that information. And Thanks. Well, if uh, anyone has anything else to say, um, I'm going to say thank you everyone for joining us. A special thanks to Shayla and Grant for joining us today. Um, th the link for tomorrow will be the same as today, FYI. So please uh, tune in tomorrow as well. Uh, and we'll be talking about organizing, reporting and writing uh, the script tomorrow, that process. Uh, 10 to 1115 uh, Central again. Um, please come with questions and we'll uh, try to break down as much of the process as we can to make it easier for all of you. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone.